Hello and welcome to Nursing Assessment Respiratory. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's start out with some of the main structures of the respiratory system. And starting out in the upper airway, so we have our upper respiratory tract there with the larynx and the pharynx, and that's going to move down into the thorax. The primary responsibility of the upper respiratory tract is to bring in air from outside to warm it, humidify it before it hits the lungs and goes into the thoracic cavity. In the thorax, we have the ribs, very important with respiration because they're going to help to define the space of the lung, and they're going to, between the intercostal muscles, they're going to help to expand and contract that thorax, which causes air to go in and out. The diaphragm, very important muscle there down at the bottom, and that is responsible for a lot of our air movement. As the diaphragm contracts, it flattens, which creates a negative pressure in the intrapleural space, which then causes air to be sucked into the lungs. We have the pleural space too, that's the area between the lung and the rib cage. There's a tiny little bit of fluid in there that helps to lubricate so that the lung doesn't rub up against the rib cage. Keep in mind the relationship of the lungs to the abdomen and the heart. As you see in this picture here, the heart's sitting right there in the middle. So if our patient has respiratory problems, they're likely to have heart problems too. As the lungs start to expand, we're gonna be compressing the heart. As patients have air trapping, which, causes, which is the result of COPD and asthma, we can have pressure on the heart. Those conditions then are going to keep the heart from filling fully and could decrease our cardiac output. On the same token, we can have problems in the abdomen. Think about someone who has ascites, a lot of fluid in the abdomen that's gonna be pressing up on the diaphragm, not allowing the diaphragm to come down when it contracts and is going to impede respirations. The lower respiratory tract is made up of the trachea. So you see our trachea in the picture here, which divides out into the bronchi, and they further divide into the bronchioles. The bronchioles then will divide into the terminal bronchioles and finally way out there into the respiratory bronchioles. Those bronchioles will divide about 17 to 23 times before we get down to an alveolus. So you can see that's a long way from that trachea. This is an important concept to know because if your patient is developing fluid in the alveoli or way out there in the terminal bronchioles and the, bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles, it's going to take a lot of work to get that fluid to come all the way back up to where the patient can expectorate it. So that's where we need that good pulmonary hygiene, the turning, positioning, the ambulation, etc., to be moving those secretions back up toward the top where they can be expectorated. Alveoli are going to branch off then. We have our alveoli ducts, alveolar ducts, which is kind of the branch. If you think about like a grape-like cluster of alveoli, there's kind of a tube in the middle there. That's the alveolar duct that's going down to our alveolus itself. So lots of branching before we hit our alveolus. We also have to talk about the pulmonary circuit. In other words, the blood flow that goes to the lungs as well. So it's good that we're getting air down into those alveoli, but it's not gonna do much good if we don't have any circulation there. It's going to be able to provide perfusion. So when you take a look at our heart here, you can see the right side is illustrated here in blue, and then we have the left side illustrated in red. For those of you who are just starting out with these concepts, the blood isn't actually blue. We make it blue in our diagrams to help to differentiate it from what's happening on the left side. So when we take a look at the right side of the heart, we have the blood coming back from the body, it goes to the right atria, down to the right ventricle, and then it goes out into the pulmonary arteries. This is the only artery in the body that carries unoxygenated blood. From the pulmonary arteries that we have many, many divisions as well, kind of like we had with our bronchi, down till we get to those fine little capillaries that surround the alveolus. Finally then, the blood picks up some oxygen, drops off its CO2, and then comes back through the pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart, left atrium, left ventricle, and then gets pumped out to the body. 
In order to be able to have perfusion occur, we have to first have ventilation. And as I mentioned before, ventilation is caused by two different pieces that are occurring. We have the diaphragm dropping, and you can see here on the illustration on the left, notice with inspiration the diaphragm drops, it becomes flat, which makes a larger space in the thorax, which creates a negative pressure, sucking air into the lungs. On expiration, the diaphragm relaxes into its cone-like shape, which makes the thorax a smaller space and pushes air out. So most of the work is being done by that diaphragm. However, when our patient needs a little extra boost, when they need to breathe a little faster or they need a little bit more air moving, for example, maybe you're going out and jogging and you need to breathe a little bit more to get rid of that CO2, you're gonna start to engage some of those intercostal muscles as well. Those are the muscles between the ribs. They're gonna to start to contract and, and relax to allow for respiration as well. So they're gonna work along with the diaphragm to increase your respirations. The gas exchange part that we started talking about earlier, now I've blown this up a little bit here to get down to the capillary networks and one alveolus. So you can see how we have our arterial going out to that capillary network and then the venule coming back. So we get all the way down till we get to capillaries there. And then let's take a look at the picture on the right there and you can see the blood coming in and it's dropping off its CO2, then it's picking up its O2 and it's going back to the left side of the heart. When we talk about the volume in the lung, we also have to consider how much air is being moved with each breath. When you're just sitting there and you're relaxed and calm, you have a tidal volume and that's just air moving in and out and it's just circulating the air that's already in the lungs. So let's take a look at this diagram to understand a little bit more about what's happening. If you were to take a deep breath in, the deepest breath you could take in, that would include your inspiratory reserve. So you have your tidal volume, that's your normal breath that you're taking, right? Add an inspiratory reserve. So take a big deep breath, and that's your inspiratory reserve. Now, if you were to blow out all the air that you could out of your lungs, that would be your expiratory reserve. Notice that there's a spot there at the bottom that you can't blow out, that's called the residual volume. The residual volume is the volume that's sitting in the alveoli all the time, keeping the alve alveoli open. If we did not have a residual volume, what would happen is every time you exhale, the alveoli would collapse, and then we'd have to try to re-recruit all of those alveoli with every breath. So instead, the body keeps some air in the alveolus. That's called our residual volume. Now normally, as you're just resting and relaxing, your tidal volume is the only thing that's moving. You're not using your expiratory reserve. You're not trying to blow all the air out of your lungs, right? You may be doing that more. There may be more of using some of that expiratory reserve if you are out jogging, for example, but at rest, you're not. So usually the only air that's moving is that tidal volume and then our expiratory reserve and our residual volume are sitting in the lungs. Now here's why this is important. The air in the lungs, the expiratory reserve and residual volume, is what's actually doing the gas exchange. The tidal volume is simply circulating that air. Think about it like this. In your house, when the heat comes on or the air conditioning comes on, it doesn't suck all the air out of the room and replace it. Instead, it circulates the air that's there. Same concept with our tidal volume. It's circulating the air that's there in the expiratory reserve and residual volume. This is controlled by a couple centers in the brain. So we have our pneumotaxic center, we have our uh, expiratory center, our inspiratory center, and all of those centers in the brain are controlling our respiration. What they're responding to primarily is going to be CO2. They also have some response to oxygen as well. So this is down there in the pons and medulla and it's recognizing that you need more air, more oxygen, less CO2, and responding by stimulating the respiratory center and the breathing. If you want to know more about nursing emergencies, check out our nursing emergencies program to decrease complications, rapidly detect problems, and implement prompt action at thenursingprof.com. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Assessment Respiratory. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.